Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wisdom Collective. This is officially episode four with our guest Benjamin Boyce. Benjamin is a YouTube commentator who does cultural commentary on the one hand, but he also has interesting interviews with a wide array of people. But what he's probably best known for is the documentary and ongoing investigative journalism he's been doing around the Evergreen State College and incidents that happened there a couple of years ago while he was a student. Now, a lot of people have heard about some of what happened at Evergreen because they're familiar with Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather Hying, and how they got kind of tangled up and involved in this incident. But honestly, when I talk to most people and ask them if they know about the story of Evergreen and what happened there just a couple of years ago, most people don't have any idea what I'm talking about. So I'm excited for you to hear from Benjamin so you can hear more about that story. I would encourage you after listening to our conversation to go subscribe to him and follow the ongoing documentary he's been doing. He's got a few more episodes to put out, but you have time to catch up between now and then. But in our conversation, in this interview, we try to look at not just what happened to Evergreen, but how a lot of what happened there kind of maps onto our current cultural moment and maybe provides a metaphor or a logic for a lot of what we're seeing in the civil unrest that we're experiencing right now. Not all of it, but certainly some of it. So I would encourage you to listen to our conversation together. It kind of goes all over the place because it's a complicated topic and idea that we're trying to pull these two things together, but I think it's fun and I think you might learn something. I would, I would love for you to subscribe, to rate, do whatever you can on whatever platform you're doing with this show. Um, it really does help me a lot. And I just thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the conversation and don't forget to follow Benjamin afterwards. All right, you guys, take care. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wisdom Collective. I'm here with Benjamin Boyce. And um, Benjamin, you have been putting together, the way I connected with you was through YouTube. You've been connecting or really telling the story of um, what's been happening or what has happened in the past at Evergreen State College in Washington. And um, yeah, do you wanna tell us a little bit about, I mean, were you a student there? How'd you get connected to that story? And what have you been doing with this little documentary or well, I don't know what you'd even call it this evolving yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's little I know it's not little yeah, uh, it's at right. 20 episodes now it's a planned 24 episodes but what the Evergreen State College is is a small liberal arts, arts college in Olympia Washington which is kind of midway between Seattle and Portland and the Evergreen State College is kind of an alternative school it's got some unique ways in which the uh, learning is set up we can get into that later mm -hmm. but it's always kind of been known as kind of a hippy dippy crunchy granola socialist school uh, and uh, you know, it's big on the cutting edge of different social movements since its uh, founding in uh, 1972. 70s? Is that, yeah. yeah it was uh, I guess it was uh, proposed or signed into existence in 68 and then it was opened in 72. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So coming up on 50 year anniversary or we already had the 50 year anniversary. And what happened was that over the course of time, the ways in which uh, far left or progressive activism uh, handled itself and the ideas that were operating within it uh, caused a particular form of uh, behavior and belief that I would argue is principally found on oppressor oppressed dynamics or victimhood uh, uh, you know, oppressor uh, dynamics. And, and over the course of time, uh, Evergreen became uh, more and more concerned with social justice in its attempt to solve societal ills. Uh, a new president came on in 2015, implemented a, uh, you know, kind of a mandate across the school that anti-racism and anti-oppression work were going to be the modus operandi of the school itself. So it was no longer a liberal arts college. It was an activist college once he got on. He uh, empowered certain, I would argue, radical professors who began to implement uh, seminars, lectures, workshops that implemented these ideas that are found in anti-racist doctrine, and I use that word in a technical sense because there's a lot of belief wrapped up in it. Uh, most notably, Robin DiAngelo's uh, white fragility or white privilege uh, dogma mm -hmm. kind of took root, and there's actually footage of professors reciting <laughs> D'Angelo's, uh, you know, her tenets of faith. Like in, and, a call, uh, like in a call and response kind of way, like repeat after me or what is it? Well, there is, there was one meeting in 2015 and I was on camera. So I, 
I, I went to the Evergreen State College starting in the winter of 2013, and I graduated in 2017. And uh, I'll get back to your question. I just want to lay out like what yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the uh, kind of the, this anti-racist doctrine became kind of the focus of the college and by, uh, you know, and, and then with the election of Donald Trump to the office of the United States presidency, as well as kind of like this more and more uh, urgent uh, demand to change the world to suit uh, an idea of equality, inclusion, diversity, and fairness, and coupled with radical professors and extremely talented, though perhaps somewhat wayward uh, students, uh, very charismatic individuals began to perform protests over the 2016-2017 school year. And then there was this event, this molehill that transfigured into a race war mountain when somebody posted a Facebook post calling for a mostly black and brown uh, students of color uh, class based on media. And then that post was parodied by a Puerto Rican Native American man, by another, another student of color who has light skin privilege instead of white privilege. So it's a diminutive form of privilege anyway. So that post was parodied. Why don't we have a mostly white class? And then that that ended up, we can get into the details. It doesn't, it either matters, it doesn't matter. But that little in incident turned into this tremendous protest that lasted a week long with, you know, uh, you know, echoes afterwards, which the students live streamed and posted directly to the internet or live stream right onto the internet. And that displays some very over the top behavior, very dramatic, uh, very worrisome, very shocking behavior on the account of the students and very lame, uh, milk toast, impotent behavior on behalf of the administrators. And then there's this Brett Weinstein um, kind of thread going through where one professor was targeted and he kind of stood up against the mob and then was uh, kind of pilloried. And then he brought that to a certain level of national attention. But I argue that even though Brett did go on Fox News, the student protesters put all the footage out there um, and the internet's much bigger than Fox News. Um, so. That's I was there while it happened. I was submitted to struggle sessions myself, which is a term uh, driving from the Chinese Cultural Revolution, where the uh, Red Guard or the student protesters pilloried and mocked and in some cases assaulted and even murdered uh, people who they thought of as capitalists. Uh, but instead of having a cultural revolution based on capitalism, the Evergreen State College's uh, absurdist version of a race war was based on a revolution around race. And it was yeah. divided, segregated based on your skin color. And you were either an ally or an apostate, or you were you know, like the cherished victim that got to uh, bray like an infant um, who is in dire need of a lollipop or a teat. Um, so I was there the whole time. I had been on camera a number of these workshops, lectures, and seminars because I worked in the media department. What I did, seeing the response to the footage of the students, was try to tell the story of what was going on behind the scenes because a lot of people were making hay over the students' behavior, but there were underlying ideas that the students were taught that I had had a problem with for several years by that point. And so I decided to, by means of uh, public records request and brute um, obsessive, evergreen-like focus, uh, exhume as much details from the events of, as possible, and beginning in August of last year, so it took me two and a half years to amass enough material to feel like I had enough to, you know, do the complete evergreen story, I began a series of videos that just chronicles uh, what happened, and what led up to what happened, and what uh, caused what happened, and then what followed what happened. Yeah. Well, it, it, well, you're touching on a lot of things. A lot of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you, honestly, is, um, I mean, I think you have, a, well, you, were, you had a nearness to this, so you have like a, a pretty good um, eye about it. But also, um, I, I found it to be, I, I don't know if frustrating is the right word, but a little bit frustrating in that um, most of the people I talk with and interact with aren't as internet cultured as you and I and others, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah maybe in part because of that, but also I, I don't know why else other 
anyway, I'll say what I'm trying to say in that it fascinates me that when I ask people, like, have you ever heard of the Evergreen State, like, incident, story, et cetera? They go, I have no clue what you're talking about. And I live, I live in Oregon, so I, I'm, I'm very close in proximity to this. It would be one thing if I'm talking to someone in Georgia. But, like, yeah. this is a state away, a, a couple few hours. I mean, it should be local news at least and known. And, and almost no one knows about it that I interact with um, mm. unless they're on the online a lot. You know, mm-hmm. um, and, and yeah. or interested in um, Brett, and maybe because of Brett, then they know some parts of it. But they don't even know the Evergreen story unless and until I connect them to you or uh, Mike Nana has obviously done some work there too. Um, but yeah. both of you have been telling that story, and uh, yeah, I think frustrating is a fine way to put it. I, I'm shocked that people haven't heard of this, in part because, and this is the other reason I wanted to talk to you. This feels like this wasn't just a cute like moment of nihilism that expressed itself on a college campus this was Hmm. there's a philosophical and a narrative understructure to this it seems like right and so you touched on some of that with you talked about struggle sessions and this white fragility idea and all these different things that sort of undergird it that those things can they transcend that moment they can they can be passed and carried into any culture and it feels like Hmm. what i've been telling people is evergreen feels like a metaphor or a narrative for a bunch Hmm. of what we're seeing in our current cultural moment. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, um, it, maybe unpack some of the, I, I want to encourage people on the one hand to go watch your what your work on YouTube, what you put together. I think that would help tell the story really clearly, but you gave us a really good like 30,000 foot view of things, but yeah. maybe unpack some of those things that you touched on with like the underlying things, the things you were growing frustrated with as you went along? Because I don't know if that comes out as much in your documentaries or not, or your docuseries. Well, the, the series itself has been uh, my attempt to be as straightforward and uh, strained of my personality as possible, even though my personality is such that it kind of leaks in and stains everything I do, you know, <laughs> just because I'm a freaking human and I'm lowly like that. But um, You're self-aware, it sounds like, which is good. Yeah. Well, yeah, even that seeps in and stains everything I do, too. Um, <laughs> we're breaking. Are we able to break the fourth wall? We'll save oh, that yeah. for later. Yeah, yeah, um, good. So, yeah, the documentary itself is just trying to just lay out the material because I have tons of material and I'm actually leaving a lot out because there are so many emails and there's so much going on in text that I'm not really presenting. I mean, I do a little bit of camera reading, but that's not really amenable to, uh, I guess, film. But we're on YouTube, so people, you know, uh, allow me to do whatever I want because they have no choice because I get to do whatever I want on the YouTube uh, until yeah. YouTube tells me I can't do it anymore. Um it could be a thing. <laughs> so, but I think one way to access how the story matters or how the story is more than just what happened um, in this college in the woods uh, that was kind of kooky to begin with is, uh, is that, you know, COVID came and hasn't gone, but COVID came this year in 2020. This is where we're speaking from. And, uh, you know, everybody got into lockdown and I was kind of trying to finish up the documentary, but I got a little burnout on it because there's a lot of work. But earlier in like midway through the documentary, I started talking about Black Lives Matter as though it's something that's already gone. You know, I kind of lay out in this one episode, I think it's episode 15, but I can't recall that where I just I just show that there's these different movements that uh, preceded Black Lives Matter. And in that particular episode, at that particular point in history, uh, early 2020, I had figured that I would give context to Black Life, Lives Matter as, uh, you know, taking, uh, like, owing to different tides of activism that have kind of gone on for several decades now uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, probably starting with the WTO uh, protests in Seattle in, I think, 99 or 2000. But then there was the Occupy Wall Street movement, and then that kind of fizzled out, and then the Black Lives Matter movement came through. And, um, And I proposed in that episode that the Black Lives Matter had basically peaked at that point. I did not know what was going to happen. Um, once everybody got into COVID lockdown. Um, so I, I'm going to have to go back and make fun of myself for putting it that way. But um, when 
the there was two incidents that kind of sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. There was an intellectual incident and then there was a visceral in, incident. And the intellectual incident or the kind of the highbrow incident was when this woman uh, kind of uh, had an interchange with a man in, in a park and the man was black and he's a bird watcher. And this woman kind of uh, flips out and, uh, and calls the police on this guy and she's screaming at him and, and that he's recording the whole thing. And that kind of went really viral in, on Internet land. And kind of uh, made everybody really charged about this issue of kind of bias and privilege and the same sets of ideas that had been kind of laid out and played with in, in the earlier iteration of Black Lives Matter movement. But also those ideas are, have uh, very further uh, previous iteration within critical race theory and postmodern theory. And uh, the, there's this huge intellectual I don't want to call it a tradition, but I guess you can call it a pile of crap or just a a massive so-called scholarship. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I'm sorry. Actually, there's probably uh, there's probably ways that I can talk about it that would be more respectful. But I see it in action. I saw the ideas in action. I saw the theory that the professors were spouting, and then I saw what those that theory did to people's behavior, right? And um, and so to get on to the track I was going that that woman in the park happened and then right after that or right before that the footage uh, surfaced of George Floyd's death um, brutal murder at the hands of or at the knee of a uh, police officer who doesn't look it, like that 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 video captured the very, like a very iconic um, moment like and you know if you if you look through and you, you kind of weigh the whole incidents there's a lot of nuance in there right like George Floyd's got some, you know, he's not a perfect person that they kind of, they might've known each other, the cop and, and him, all the, all this weird stuff, but you, that stuff doesn't matter when the in, incident takes hold. And what happened at the Evergreen State College was that there was an incident of significant enough representative value to trigger uh, this conception of the world as one in which a certain uh, type of person or a certain class of person is consistently, constantly, and implicitly oppressed constantly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when that happened this year with George Floyd, and then the protests started happening, and there's a lot going on in those protests, I think those protests were fueled largely about people being cooped up and not giving not given the ability to release their energy um and the media is very complicit in in pushing this narrative because this is what the media wants to push right now and that gets back to your point about why nobody knows about evergreen because people don't want to push the evergreen story the media does not want you know you to see uh the the flip side of this ideology you know they, they want to show you the revolution and the liberation they don't want to show you that the, the actual oppression that happens uh, when uh, narcissistic sociopaths get to the top of the order and start to exert their will. Anyway, so when that when those protests broke out, <laughs> um, those Black Lives Matter protests and then the riots broke out and all the different things that happened surrounding that with the ways in which people were behaving, the washing of the feet and the praying to one another. And the uh, I mean, my mayor in Olympia, she bowed to the protesters. And then a week later, her uh, her her house is like spray painted with BLM, even though she's got a BLM poster in her freaking like a poster window. or flag or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's got the she's got the pride flag and the BLM flag, and then and then they go like racist BLM, abolish the police or whatever. Um, I I was really triggered. I was like literally, I went into panic mode because like everything that I was seeing going on in the world at that point totally brought me back to what happened at the Evergreen State College, mm -hmm. and all of the different elements that were happening at the Evergreen State College happened all at the same time. And it was like the Evergreen State College was was like a pilot program or a roadmap to revolution based on, you know, this at this point in history, race, you know, but you could like plug in any sort of oppressor oppressed dynamic. Um, so there's certain mechanics underneath the surface of the Evergreen State College um, that I've been studying and that I've been dissecting and then that I've been witnessing happen over and over and over again in little tiny pockets, like in quilting communities and other colleges and like in the atheist movement and any given certain sort of collective of individuals once they get infected with this ideology it just goes bonkers and narcissistic sociopaths get to the top of the order people start to perform witch hunts there's purity spirals 
it becomes in uh, not just in hospitable, but in uh, not habitable for actual human interaction. Like you can't be a human being in environments where this stuff no. takes root. Not because something it, it, that's a constant, that's in a constant state of purification like that. There's no, yeah. and, and there's no, um, there's not a clear objective end or goal other than we must be continually reforming and fixing and, uh, and the fixing will never be done. And yeah. the fixing is, it's, it's not just paternalistic. It's like, it's, it's paternalistic, but then it's like, if you keep it with that metaphor, it's almost like um, abusive parenting, you know, like a normal child, like mm -hmm. interaction or issue, you would deal with it in an appropriate, you you'd respond appropriately, the volume would be appropriate. But the response here is essentially, uh, either get on or get out, like I'm kicking you out of the house, you 12 year old mm -hmm. brat, you know, and uh, because you're not agreeing to the house rules, and you're out. And then it's like, well, there's no that's just compliance. There's no justice. There's no reform. There's no redemption. Anyway, well, there's no dialogue for certain. Well, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So maybe we'll get into some of that too. Yeah. So um, let's unpack some of the, so that helps. Yeah. This has been iterating. I cut you off a little bit. This has been iterating across different moments within culture. Um, but you're seeing this kind of convergence right now, like during COVID. Right. Um, so I guess keep going with that. Yeah. Well, okay. So like there, there's, number of different levels to the evergreen state college story um the brett weinstein thread is very compelling and it's 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 the entry point though and that's how i considered it and, and i'm personal friends with brett i don't mean to diminish his work and he's much greater than the evergreen state college story but if you watch the mike nina documentary and where where i diverge from mike nina is that mike nina gives you something that you can actually you know, comprehend because it's got a certain stable set of characters and kind of a plot arc. A the way that I, yeah, and a narrative, right? It, it's much cleaner, tighter story. And I, I, I don't envy the guy, but I, I very much respect the work that he's done. I, I break through all that stuff, and that's because I'm, I'm essentially a postmodernist myself. Like tried and true, died in the blue. I just consider myself on the Jedi side of postmodernism, <laughs> as opposed to the Sith side. <laughs> um, but there, there's so there's different layers of how the students were acting with the authority, how the students were acting with one another, how the authority was acting with the professors. Like like there's all these different relationships, and I see that replicated very much so in the way that people are having a moral panic right now with regards to young people, probably teenagers and college age kids, like policing each other on online. Like, did you post that black square? Oh, you didn't post that black square. Like, oh, maybe you're not really an ally. Maybe you're not doing the right thing. Thing. You know, that was going on at the Evergreen State College. There was a very strong drive and it happened really quickly and really urgently where people just shut down. Well, the students shut down any dissent whatsoever and because they needed to change the world right now. They needed to, to dismantle this white supremacist institution that was probably the most anti-racist progressive institution that you could find at that point. There's probably a couple of other contenders, but the Evergreen State College was full bore with this stuff. And what that did was inculcate within the students brains and within the faculty's brains and within the administrators brains even the top dog i wouldn't call him a dog well i would call him a dog but a certain word for a certain kind of dog um, but we won't use gendered language in this podcast quite yet um he's on film the president the current president um george bridges who has not been held responsible whatsoever for his bungling of this i'm, I'm the only person that is putting him to the fire. I'm just a lowly citizen. He, the vice, uh, some vice documentarians came through and they interviewed George Bridges and they asked him, there's this, there's this brilliant exchange. It just really shows just how crazy things are, but they're not that crazy anymore. Cause this stuff is just, this stuff is now the water. Like right. it was shocking when it happened at Evergreen, but this stuff is just everywhere now. Um, and the vice documentarian, I can't remember the guy's name. Um, he does a lot of good work, but he asked George Bridges, he says, you know, I hear a lot of students calling you a white supremacist. Are you a white supremacist? And George Bridges says, no. Well, maybe. And the vice documentary is like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And yeah. then George Bridges is like, well, it depends on what you define as white supremacist. I'm a white male in a position of power. Right. So that 
that shows a lot. There's there's so many different things to unpack. So I, I'll need you to like tell me where to go. But like you can see at that point that this ideology undermines authority. It 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 completely strips the authority um, away from competency. It takes away the the authority of positions and of competency and of meritocracy or just whether or not it was a clean meritocracy, whether or not it's a pure or a corrupt system, but it completely dismantles the apparent system. And then it reconfigures that in an urgent bid of power based on probably the stupidest thing to base authority on, which would be um, not just your immutable characteristics, but it starts with your immutable characteristics added with your willingness to completely take all the power that you want and just demand it full throttle. And if you look at the people who had the most power in that situation, you'll see some very fascinating characters. And again, I would argue that you could probably say that they have uh, bipolar disorder, like they have some definite personality disorders in the way that they behave and the way that they see the world and the way that they treat other people. So one question that I've always been proposing is that either this Either this ideology, which I don't know what you want to call it, but it's the system of ideas. People have different names for it, but whatever. This ideology either empowers the uh, narcissistic sociopaths or it empowers those characteristics in people. Like it, in, it unlocks, mm -hmm. like, like it kind of like, you know, like in some sort of video games, like, oh, you unlock this superpower. You know, it turns out to be like a horrible personality trait, but that's what it does. It activates that stuff um, for very clever and interesting reasons. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, well, and that's an interesting way of putting it because there is this, well, you're familiar with, um, because it's such a popular quote, I'm sure you're familiar with it, like uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn has that quote about like the line dividing, it would be so nice if we could just round everyone yeah. up, all the bad people, throw them in some sort of, sort of a fire and get rid of them, so to speak. Um, but uh, the problem with that is that the line dividing good and evil isn't between states and politics and allegiances, it's between the heart of every human being, anyway. Yeah. So he gets yeah. at that, and then obviously the, the kind of poetic close to that thought is, and who's willing to cut out a piece of their own heart? Like, so mm. it's mm. like, it's a, yeah. it's a, that's a difficult thing to do, to not only to know that you have that in you, but to recognize that and to not like that, anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, that's probably right. I don't know. I think your second take might be more right that this is just activating things that are normal to a lot of us. Like if we have like we give in to, or we have our dark thoughts from time to time, you know, but if you were to sort of give into that and live into that, you would be a different type of person, you know, mm -hmm. or you'd be mm -hmm. the type of person that would ascend this hierarchy and just. A yeah. Way. yeah. Yeah. There's this um, there was there was this feeling that I got as a student there um, that kind of increased up to the explosion of sanctimoniousness. And the early videos that I have that I show in my documentary that start in 2015 show these pseudo church services. Um, one of the first, um, what, one of the first actual organized events that took the college in this direction was called coming together, a call to action, which was, based on the email that one of the professors wrote about um, being uh, being afraid of for her life because she's uh, she's half black and she has half black or quarter black children. And, um, you know, and, and Olympia is just teeming with racism. And then if she steps out of her house, she's pretty certain that she's going to get shot. And she writes this and one person who turns out to be a trans individual. So this person is on the nexus of uh, identity uh, or, 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 or oppression in and of themselves, pipes up and says, you guys are always talking about how Evergreen's so racist and Olympia's so racist, but it's not. This is not teeming with racism. And the fact that you guys always shoot down anybody who disagrees with you and then call them a racist just shows that you guys aren't capable of actually seeing what's going on. And because you can't see what's going on, you're not gonna be able to fix anything. Yeah. And then, all the people come out of the woodwork and do exactly what he said that they do. It's like, you are a privileged freaking white male that changed your sex. Well, they didn't call out his gender because they can't, right? But you're a privileged white person. You would, it's invisible to you. This is implicit bias. You know, and they go and they just do this mob and they beat him. And then everybody like, well, not everybody, but key players come out and just like start singing their grievances. It, it's this crazy email chain. And that shows that these people have the power. Like these people who are 
per, you know, the, they're, it, 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 like this chorus, this grievance chorus comes out, you know, and they're like oppression, you know, like some sort of Greek tragedy or maybe even a church service. And so based on that email chain, they, they set up this uh, call to action coming together a call to action and and the president he's new president he's he empowers these people and they they like say like look at look at the data you know like the data is just like we're not doing good enough and every point of data that they show s says that they're doing they're doing better than anybody else yeah. with like getting more latin people latino people in getting more serving more uh you know people of color and keeping them there longer and th they're doing really good but th somehow they they like twist it into like like th things are so dire so like the the reality is not matching up to their narrative and their narrative but they they they're just like tearing it apart on stage they're just tearing apart the distinction between reality and th their version of truth and the the weird thing and I'm on camera I'm I'm on camera I'm like watching this stuff and um I well, I'm behind camera yeah yeah. And they they punctuate this, you know, this kind of like this, these lectures and these talks about racism with these, this, I believe, statements where professors stand up with a microphone or, or you know, students, workers, and they're like, this, I believe, you know, and, and they're, they're like talking about like, this is what I believe. And, and my first professor stands up and, and she gives this litany about how Evergreen is as implicit in white supremacy as any institution in the history of European art. And when, when we allow students to say all lives matter, we're, we're diminishing black lives and, and people and white people just ignore their privilege and we can't teach them about their privilege. And so the students of color are always marginalized. And this, this litany of, of, of belief comes out of her mouth and she's like throwing Western are this is what's offensive to me i'm not a i'm i don't think i'm a white supremacist but i really adore like my tradition like i really adore that and that's why i went to college is to figure out how i can add to my tradition and i have my first teacher saying you know all of western art just needs to like we just need to stop teaching it because it's supremacist and she just like shits all over the canon she just shits all i'm sorry about that but that's what she does oh, yeah She's, it, it, and it's a pattern of behavior but it's wrapped up in the sanctimoniousness and you can feel it in the air that really thick uh culty vibe right and so i grew up in the church uh, my dad's a pastor well he's a chaplain now he kind of retired but i i've attended a lot of different churches we we went from one church to another for a long time because my parents got in, involved in a destructive cult i guess you could say like somebody who had it was very controlling and there was a central authority who changed everybody's names and told who could live with who and like you know like really intense stuff with demonology and like exercising the shit out of people sorry yeah. exercising yeah. demons out of people um and that we left when I was really young, but that that was always in my head as a as a structure of society that, that was bad, right? And and, and yeah, that's that, not a good way to organize social groups for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. not at all. Not and, if you want a common humanity, yeah. No, yeah, no. Well, yeah, unless yeah, unless you you want to get stuck in that. And there's different there's different things about this. <coughs> religiosity that's different from a classical cult or like a cult that like one of those cults that sprung up in the 70s you know the post hippie era where there was a lot of at least on the west coast there was a whole lot of like ashrams and like sure. uh you know christian or off christian or eastern cults um and a lot of the patterns of those was that there's a central authority in this particular uh, in this particular rubric, this doctrine, there's no central authority. It's really weird. It's crowdsourced. And, and, and actually, it's constantly raising up, um, it's raising up a victim to a position of power and then sacrificing them. It's, it's very, it's bloodbathy as all get up. Because th as soon as you're in a position of power, then you need to be destructed too right you need to be you know submitted to and and it, it's really unstable but it 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 picks up speed it's like this this kind of like this wave form of like people on top so it's not it's not centralized there's something much different from it but i just i remember that so i was gonna say what's interesting with that is that it i don't like using terms like this but it uh, about people at least but it, it, it makes it more or less like parasitic in that it can adapt and live as long as there's like a host somewhere, it can move and, and kind of take on a new shape and form, especially with that structure of 
oppressor oppressed like you said or some sort of a power hierarchy dynamic yeah. it can it can take on form anywhere it doesn't have to be uh some iterations of blm have that but it doesn't have to be about race at all it could be about all sorts of things as long as it has that dynamic in place it can adapt and yeah live and kill at the same time yeah no yeah i mean i'm sure that you're probably aware that it is infecting christian churches 100 percent. yeah yeah which is part of why i wanted to talk to you as well i mean I, my audience is mixed it's not only christian but um the uh well and maybe you can speak to this i want to do a couple of things benjamin i want to i want to define some terms maybe and and we can even like riff a little bit on the religious associations or like correlations of some of these terms and ideas um but I, I want to say this, that there's so many people, and maybe you can speak to this about Evergreen, there's so many people that get wrapped up into this with the absolute best of intentions, right? Um, they, they really are, there's a naivete to a lot of, at least within the church, there's a, it's a mix. There's some people that are just charged and young and excited, and every young generation wants to be about some sort of revolution, whether macro or micro. They want to change something mm. and mm. resist <laughs> resist and respond to tradition, right? That's a part of just, that is a human yeah. development phase of that too. Like you become an adult all of a sudden on your own and you get to question your parents' upbringing or like everything yeah. that you have, you know? Yeah. And so there's some naturalness to that, but there's also, uh, yeah, to radicalize it or to moralize it at the level that this thing can, it's a whole other beast. And anyway, I say all mm. that to say within the church, I see a number of people that are, they're genuinely trying to like, be a part of helping and changing, but they're not asking critical questions about like, what's all baked into this cake? You know, what's going on here? You know, mm -hmm. they really are trying to adopt some of this with good intention. But um, anyway, what, what's I don't, the point I don't of ramble what, too much. But no, what's what one point of entry that you so think? One point of entry would be um, the, the honest recognition. So people are social animals, right? And they're not only social animals, they're very groupish. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's part of the reason, it's not the only reason, why um and people are also individual too but um we're we're a good mix of both like jonathan height talks about we're like 95 percent b and then five percent chimp you know yeah. he's like you know we're like we're great apes but we're also like very good at organizing a structure in a society in a group mm -hmm. in a complex way anyway so i would i would hold to that um and i think when you do that anytime you try and pursue something um of excellence you have to strike the balance between Hmm. Um, competition and cooperation. That's the true alpha. The true alpha isn't the most complete. We caricature We caricature the alpha as the most competitive beast imaginable, like the biggest, baddest wolf in the pack. That's not mm -hmm. right. The biggest, baddest wolf in the pack would get kicked out or killed because they're dangerous or, or they yeah. set you into danger. But it's the one who can cooperate and be competitive most at the same time. Anyway, yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting off track here. So anyway, um, there's a reality to that. And I think the church tends in general, tends to attract like high empathy, high uh, mm -hmm. cooperation oriented people. Mm -hmm. And even if they aren't that, it, it kind of brings that out in people if they weren't naturally like that, which is, can be great. It can be really good. Um, but it can organize us into groups. Um, they question the competitive side of just what humanity is. I think um, we have a competition. Uh, nature. Competitive empathy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is yeah. intense stuff. And that's what you really see. You really, really see that. Uh, you know, like there's one way of casting it as the devouring mother, but it, there is a very, you know, um, I think on a mythological or arch archetypal level, we kind of imagine it as a feminine movement. Like there, it's it's based in compassion. It's based in empathy. It's based in, in tending. And where does that stop? How do you when can you, you know, when do you pull back? When do you give hardness? When does the authority, you know, the, the traditional kind of, or the archetypal masculine values are very undervalued in this. Right. Um, and well, and so it does breed. Undervalued. And, they're like, they're uh, demonized. Right? You know, well, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. My, my first day at Evergreen, there was a, no one wins under, you know, smash the patriarchy. No one wins under rule of men or anything. And like, I knew that like, like, I understand what they're doing, but I also see on another level they're doing something else. They're they're, they're interacting. We're always interacting with a mythological substrate, right? And so and it mirrors down. And when we when we start to enshrine certain, especially certain revolutionary ideas, when you put that on top, when you put dismantling or smashing or some sort of you know representation of violence on top of the you know, hierarchy of values, then you're gonna you're entering into 
complete destabilization. You're you're initiating a process of of destabilization, which might be necessary in certain yeah. Well, parts. in certain iterations, but yeah. it, not as a standard or as a objective like role in, or a constant. And and like you said earlier, in a different way, you you incentivize the worst actors when you do that. Whether or not yeah. you're calling something out in someone, or it's someone who already has that and is like, well, this would be a nice opportunity for me. Um, it doesn't matter. It you incentivize the worst actors anyway. Another entry point, dude, would be that we might be relevant to what you were talking about and some of our cultural moment would be uh, MLK and others have riffed on this before and after him, but the idea of it, Sunday is the most segregated day in the United States, that idea, <laughs> right? And, and people look around at their churches and they say, well, geez, like on the, on the, um, hmm. if I just take race as one of or the uh, immutable characteristic, like, yeah, a lot of churches, most churches are fairly segregated. Now, the complicated part of that is most of our lives, everyone's lives, is in some respects like that. I mean, there, there's some cosmopolitanness to people, but mm. um, most people, er erroneous of their race, are fairly groupish, and there's some familiarity there and all the rest. And uh, it doesn't mean mm. you don't relate to others, um, but people are pretty groupish, and then culture can take hold, and there's lots of things that go into that. But anyway, um, I say I like to say people look around, they see, okay, they hear a phrase like that, and it's a compelling phrase, right? And mm -hmm. then they're like, well, how would I answer this? What do I do about this? And I would put some of the blame on the church and that we haven't articulated a great um, counter story or a great alternative story to some of this um, stuff. So like a thing like white fragility comes up, it's clearly mm -hmm. talking about race. It's mm -hmm. clearly talking about the problem that they seem, or though it seems like a problem, maybe they're moralizing it too much, but it seems like a problem. And then this is basically the hammer and now everything becomes a nail, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a, in that respect, um, that would be another entry point. And that's what I mean though, about the best of intentions. Like there's some of these people that are like, they hear this quote, this idea, they look around and they're like, well, yeah, that kind of maps onto reality. And then they're looking for a tool and then up, up pops this Robin D'Angelo, yeah. whoever, it doesn't have to be just her, but yeah. she's definitely a key player anyway. Um, and then, they're off to the races and trying to fix problems out loud, which is just yeah. fascinating. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe we could define some terms. I think that might be helpful because you mentioned some, well, actually, and I want to say something else too. I think it was clear in what you talked about. It's definitely clear in your documentary, but this was a full scale, like takeover of the college that happened, right? Uh, yeah. Hostage you, taking, uh, community policing with bats, like, and this like went on for like, stuff. it wasn't like, oh, that was a weird 24 hours. This went on for days, right? Uh, yeah, it went on for probably a couple weeks, probably. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty yeah. intense stuff. Like the, the, the very, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, I guess you could probably call them spiritual currents. I don't know how to define it in a non-woo-woo term, but like the, the feeling on campus was really, really dark. It was a really, yeah. really heavy. I could barely breathe some days. Just like even being the only person on campus, like on Sunday, like going into my desk job, you know, like just manning a phone, like I could barely breathe. It was so intense. It was, it was a dark, they summoned something very, very heavy and performed it. And, and they, they did rituals leading up to it. Like they did songs and dances and chants and, and they, wow. they circled around and they did a lot. They did a lot of literal summoning. They literally like they, surrounded black students and sung songs to them. The professors did that um, during this or after this thing called the canoe meeting where they uh, where they 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 adapted or they appropriated some native, uh, you know, kind of ritual. And then they put that uh, and they married that to they're going to change the world for the better based on racialization, based on this concept of equity, which is not equality and going through and saying literally don't rock the boat. If you're going to, you can, we can have discussions, but if you're going to get in the way you need to leave, you need to get out of our way. You're either on the boat or you're gone, you know, and, and very explicitly and, and absolute no explicitness for what they were actually doing. Like they were like their, their actual data and their plan was like, Oh, just, just trust us. We did a lot of work on this. You have to do it too. This is really important. Well, what's the word? It's really important work. And I'm on camera again. I'm on camera. And this is like a week after the Trump, uh, you know, the, he won the election. And so everybody's like, eh, yeah. it's skipping out about that. But I'm on camera and like, it was like a church service. I'm like feeling them, uh, you know, the, the, 
religious, the, the, the importance of a religion is that it allows us to interact with parts of us that are communal and emotional and deeper than that. Right. right. And, and it accesses very deep regions of our, of our consciousness. Let's say, I think that's a safe enough term by means of emotion, music, sensuality, um, chance and, and syncing up. And, and, and it's very effective at doing that. And that's why religion is so dangerous. And even if you want to believe in God, you still need to be very aware of how dangerous this stuff is and be very attentive to what it's doing to you. And, and, you know, there can be arguments about, you know, like older traditions being kind of subject to time enough to be kind of clean of, of certain forms of manipulation, but people will manipulate it no matter <laughs> what. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they were they were resurrecting. They were they were taking this doctrine of equity and then they were marrying it with religious uh, symbolism and activity and putting it together. And and I could see I was in the room and I'm, I'm I'm in the room over and over and over again, watching them unite themselves. And then and then off to the side, I didn't know until after I did the research, they're shoving everybody out of the way and like and suppressing speech and sanctioning people that don't get on board on this. Like it's, it's a coup. It's a coup de race, actually. That's what I've been yeah. calling it lately. Um, yeah. So it, it's very interesting. And, and, and I think that they do that because of certain steps that they've taken earlier on in the, in the, in the development of this doctrine, um, in the development of postmodern uh, critical theory and the, uh, the exculpation or the shoving out of logic, the shoving out of empiricism, the castigating of those things as tools of supremacy, right? So once you clear the board of rationality, you're left with, what are you left with? You're left with assertion. You're left with power. How does power organize without reason? It uses emotion. And what is the great, the greatest tools that have developed? You're eventually going to gravitate on an intuitive level to religious symbolism and religious yeah. tools and stuff. And so I I think that insofar as critical race doctrine, white privilege, this whole this whole network of ideas, insofar as it it wants to bid for a viable reality, a viable worldview, it will eventually need to adopt and adapt works of art to itself. And that's where it's actually going to prove whether it works or not. Can these can these ideas exist in an epic can you write an epic based on this can you write a post-gender epic i don't think you can i don't think you can write an epic that is just uh, non-binary i don't think it's, there's not enough energy between everybody who's not distinct enough i'm just i'm i'm adopting the gender yeah. uh conversation because i do i've done a lot of work on the gender topic too that yeah. was my i needed to get away from race for a bit and that's where i ended up um so we'll see um, as as this ideology and as this morality affects and impacts big businesses, including Hollywood. Now we're going to see Hollywood start to try to produce works of art that fall in line with this dynamic. Are those works of art going to actually persist? Are they going to evoke uh, deeper layers of the human experience rather than just passion? Right. So so the the problem, and I think the the kind of the fail safe of this doctrine and of this dogma is that it does interact with people based on very uh, deep uh, you know, kind of emotional substructures, but they, they, they don't really uh, lead to anything good, right? They end up leading to uh, a welling up of selfishness, a welling up of the ego, a welling up of envy, a welling up of shame, right? A welling up of guilt, but no freedom from any of that stuff. So it eventually creates such a chaotic system that that it can't sustain itself, right? And people can have, to, they get exhausted by worshiping through this stuff or worshiping what this stuff wants you to worship um, that, that I don't think it's going to lead to anything positive, right? So the, the question you have to ask when you watch this infiltrate your, let's just say your church, um, you'll see that it, it's asking you to put yourself into categories of privileged and oppressed, right? And you're like, okay, well, let's go along and do that. Um, but there's these little hidden tricks in there that like wants you to start to give up your shame, give, give your guilt. And I, I don't think guilt is bad. I don't think shame is bad. I think they're very personal. So I don't give them to anybody else. I have panic attacks all the time, like anxiety attacks, but that's mine. I'm not giving that to somebody else. If I give that to somebody else, 
then they can control me. So you have to watch when this stuff comes in, it's going to want to evoke these uh, processes of, of shame, of guilt, of looking back, of regret, of, of, of ownership of your history or your ancestry or, or that microaggression you said when you didn't hold the door open for the right person or, or asked where somebody was from, you know, like, like it starts to creep into every human experience and reduce it into this network of, um, of tearing apart, of criticizing every th stable form of interaction, making you very conscious of it, but conscious in the wrong way. It's a form of Gnosticism, I think, um, where, yeah, where you're think... trying to, to ascend into a greater form of being by only focusing on all the negative in life. So it actually doesn't work, right? Well, and that's a tension, dude, because, and again, trying to get to that, um, I, don't, I don't know that as far as the ideology goes that there's... I need to be doing this practice of like, where's, where's the best part in this? So let's steal man. Maybe we'll do that later, but like, let's steal man, like the critical race theorist, intersectionalist or whatever person's argument ideas or whatever. So we can get there later maybe, but the, uh, the people that are getting like wrapped up into this, like, yeah, there's, um, I, I lost my thought there. I'm sorry, but there's something to what you were talking about with like, that there's something, um, good in these. Fo oh, that's part of what it is, is that it's, it's tapping into so much of what just we are as people. And this is where I would distinguish, although it's not a cult in the sense of like the 70s, 60s, woo woo stuff you're talking about. Yeah, it is a cult in a lot of respects where it its tactics are similar and that it separates you from social groups. Um, any social tie that you'd have, be that family, be that um, whatever, only into itself. And then yeah. it's constantly separating you in that. Ironically, yeah. it'll lead to a, a radical individualism if it actually like kept up with itself. But um, I wonder because it'll it would divide people in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. It but does anyway, do that. yeah. Um, I don't know that it would ever let that happen. But anyway, yeah. It um, it's tapping into something there, but it's also it's cutting you off. And again, that shame piece is that's the right way of putting it. it. It makes you ashamed of who you are and all of your ties to a culture and all of your ties to family and all of your ties to whatever. So now it's only the group that can save you, protect you and bring mm. you salvation or whatever. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and if you were to ever change your mind, there's nowhere to go or to go back to. You've burned all the bridges. There's nothing to like. Yeah. How do you, that's a good point too. you can't really undo some of these things. It's, if you get into them that hard. You know? Well, yeah. And, and, from the get-go um, of my work, and this is probably owing to my tact or my tactic or my strategy for investigating this stuff of, of pulling out Evergreen and completely dissecting the entire thing. Um, and then all the work I did between going through all these documents online, like investigating other colleges, investigating uh, the ways in which media is starting to operate this way, you know, like doing the whole YouTuber thing and like figuring out what I can do. One persistent question is that, okay, I know people are going to get caught up in this and I think it's going to set them down a wrong path, you know, and, and just like you said, it, it does explicitly. I have footage of professors saying, you know, if your family doesn't agree with this, you just need to cut them off. Like you need to cut off people who don't want justice. Like they are in the way of justice. You can't change them. So just get them out of your life. Right. Like all these really dangerous stuff. Yeah. Right. And, and, and this just... is in some of this, dude, it's like, it's dangerous. And again, this is part of that thought I was talking about, about seeing the best and trying to find the best in the people that are getting swept up in this. Cause there might be a way to redeem some of these people or like bring them back, you know, from the precipice. But um, a lot of times, well, this gets put as a lot of different ways online anyway, but the, a lot of times their assessment or when say a, a critical theorist or someone makes an assessment of things, they, they're at times recognizing true or real realities, but then their moral uh, mm. judgment on that reality is so askewed and it's, it's, mm. well, it's maybe vindictive or whatever the case might be. Um, but it moralizes it in a way that like escalates it way up. It turns what would be like should be a disagreement between two people into a moral sin of cosmic order, right? Yeah. It, it, so it again, it's not. But it's such a tension. That's what's part of the allure to it, and part of the danger of it actually is that it draws you in because a lot of times it is recognizing a real thing. Uh, but then mm. the tension is it's moralizing it to a volume that's like way above what should be appropriate. Um, anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. I, 
I'm trying to look at my own life and like, why did I avoid that? Why did I always have a negative reaction to activism, let's just say? And, you know, like even in high school, like I'd see the people uh, doing the save the world or save the whales, maybe, or save the rainforest stuff. And, and uh, you know, seeing the idea and like knowing that it's a moral virtue that's going on, but seeing something else going on there too, that I just couldn't like actually like just embody in myself. And, you know, maybe I'm just you know selfish person. Maybe I'm just a prick, right? Maybe I just like don't really care about the world and stuff. But like, I actually, when I got out of that period of life where I should have gone to college and I didn't because I had weird brain things going on, or I was again, just like weird messed up person. I ended up working in preschool. I ended up working with children. I ended up actually serving human beings and cultivating personality and interacting with the human being as an entire envelope of just messy substance, right? Like, like a child, it's just like emotion, curiosity, brilliance, wit, uh, just complete urgency, selfishness, you know, like, like a complete, uh, egotism, like only seeing the world as a function of myself. Um, and, and actually like, you know, they, they say, uh, you know, those who can do those who can't teach. And like when I was in preschool, I'm like, okay, wh what can't I do? It's like, oh, I can't be a human being. So I'm trying to teach myself how to be a human being by interacting with these people who are becoming human beings. Like that's what I'm learning while I'm teaching this stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I am a humanitarian in a, in a certain respect. And and then when I, when I went to college and, and you see, okay, well, there's, there's racism. There's these really bad outcomes. There's these huge discrepancies between uh, black uh, individuals who are descendant from slaves in America and white people, like the huge numbers, these huge numbers. Like, okay, well, how do we solve that problem? Mm -hmm. Like, that's the question. Like, do I solve that problem by shaming myself into sub submissions? Do I, do I solve the problem by bringing down the white person? to the level like well that feels like they're rising up like from the perspective of the marginalized when you're watching the privilege fall it does feel like elevation it's yeah. like you're just projecting the gravity or the that that act of of falling you know like in this where you feel high in the moment but it doesn't actually build yourself up right i saw that i saw that in practice these ideas in practice i saw these marginalized individuals not concentrate on gaining skills, not concentrate on inventing something new, not concentrate on figuring out this, figuring out a problem and solving that and deriving value from the world by solving a problem, which would be a very clean uh, conception of what capitalism could be. It's just like a, a system of problem solving. Nobody was interested in learning how to solve the problem. They wanted somebody else to fix it. They wanted George Bridges to fix it. They want the administration to fix it. Yeah. There's this really interesting exchange during the protest. <coughs> it's not an exchange, it's a refrain. Where the students demand no police. They demand the disbandment of the police. They want no police whatsoever. And then while they're doing that, they're demanding George Bridges, the, the administrator, keep them safe because we're not safe and it's your job to keep us safe. And we want the authority gone. We don't want you to have authority, but we want you to keep us safe. It's like yeah, yeah. like all these <laughs> contradictions going on. And, and there's this there's this seeding of agency uh, away from yourself. You, you give your shame to the group. You give your guilt to the group. You give your decisions to the group. You give your identity your individuality to your identity and then the group kind of parses it up right and then you give up your responsibility you give up yourself uh, your self-worth and you give up your ability to reflect on, on your actions and own your actions so that you can act better in the future you give up uh, your intentionality you give up your will like like it successively yeah. destroys your your sovereignty right yeah. and and so i, I I know I'm being really messy in this talk. I'm no, always you're messy, good. though. I'm very, <laughs> a very messy person. Um, but I, I see activism as trying to solve a problem by having society solve the problem. I, I see it yeah. like just instinctually. And, and there is good things in this. We do live in a society. You know, and this is this is a Wendy's, right? Like like there's a way that this thing operates. And yeah. A political movement is good at, at reforming government, reforming the laws like these. These things are really good at doing that insofar as those things have an effect on individuals. But if you look at the outcome 
of every single democratic. I'm sorry, I'm not really, I don't like politics. I never wanted to do any of this stuff. But if you look at the ways in which the government goes in and tries to solve a problem, let's just say solves poverty, yeah. it doesn't solve poverty. The poverty <laughs> remains stable, but there's this huge corporate bureaucracy that yeah. uh, causes the ability for a certain class of people to have middle class wealth, right? It, it just, it institutes a program of more middle classness. So it, it does, it doesn't solve a problem, but it just shuffles resources. It expands the middle class in a certain way, but it doesn't solve pro poverty. What solves poverty? Is it, what solves oppression? If I deny the fact that I'm oppressed and, and, and not to say that I'm not oppressed, but to deny that oppression to have power over me and and to develop tools of ignoring it or of of uh quelching it right and of making it meaningless mm -hmm. every individual that i've seen who has been oppressed who has succeeded beyond that oppression has left the oppression behind and everything embedded in this anti-oppression rubric actually centers oppression it centers ra racism it centers everything it says it's against yeah. Right. It, it says that we are for equality. It completely eradicates equality by just distributing oppression onto white males. And it literally does this at the Evergreen State College. I have it on record. A judge, a judge condemned them like or, or made a judgment. It's in the record. They did discriminate. The Evergreen State College did have racism and were actively systemically racist against white males because they thought it was OK to be that way. It's actually not OK. Maybe someday it will be okay. Maybe that's the direction we're headed. But I don't think that that actually solves anything. I think that the 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 undergirding, if you look at the individuals it produces, and then you look at other systems, like what is the kind of individual that I want to become? And therefore, what is the sort of belief system that will engender those qualities in me, right? And 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 harness my guilt and my shame towards the end of mastery, right? or yeah. towards the end of, of sensitivity and moral moral functioning. What if my version of caring for another person isn't to care for them, but to enable them to care for themselves, right? Uh, and that was my tact as a preschool teacher. And and I think that that tact needs to be balanced with a more motherly uh, form of, of, of caring and coddling and feeding and, and closeness. Uh, I, 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 you know, I kind of resist that on a number of different reasons and levels of being very that way towards, you know, the, the, my wards during that time, I was more the active one, the, the challenger, you know, like the, okay, like the way that I'm going to be physical with you is I, you're going to try to defeat me in a contest, right? You got, I'm going to lay on the ground and you guys are going to try to get, stop me from standing up. So I have like 15 kids stopping me from standing up. So it was, it was a, it was competitive, but I was, I was empowering them. And then when somebody gets hurt, you walk them through the ways in which they're expressing their pain. And I'm not the man who says it's not okay to cry. I'm, I'm the man who says, you know, emotions aren't wrong, but if they're controlling you, then you're not in control anymore. You need to be on top of your emotions. So it's not yeah, that the emotions are wrong. It's, yeah. it's your stance towards the emotions. Whose temper, are you having a temper or is your temper having you? You know, like, like yeah. that, that yeah. kind of thing. Right? Yeah, no, that's the right way of putting it. Yeah, we'll say things like, um, uh, well, if we're borrowing this, it's a, a popular quote, but like your emotions are real. Like your, your pain might be real in so many ways, but it may not always be trustworthy, you know? And so mm -hmm. you, you got to be careful how you or where you put your trust in the, yeah. in your experience. And so in that respect, you don't denigrate or take away or say experience means nothing. That's stupid. Experience matters, but um, it's just not always trustworthy either. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's an anomaly. Sometimes it's whatever. So yeah. anyway, uh, you'll appreciate and, and, this. Right, go ahead. Sorry. Well, just the, the same holds true with like facts. If you take a dichotomous view of facts and feelings, facts aren't enough to get through lef, life either, no. right? And no, feelings aren't enough either. either. So the, the yeah. humanity is always, humanity is always between heaven and hell, yeah. right and wrong, left and right. It's always between that. It's always between that. That's where agency lies. Yes. And, and I know you've had some conversations with, um, well, I've had one conversation with him on here, but with Jonathan Pagel, and he's, He's so helpful in articulating the, oh, yeah. the dynamics that you're talking about, about in particular, like a heaven and earth reality. Like everything has a little heaven and a little earth in it. Everything has mm. something that transcends it and something that is like relevant. And you might say at the philosophical level, that's objective truth and subjective truth. I think that's a dumb dichotomy because everything is at once almost both at any given moment, right? 
there's yeah. something objective happening and something that's subjectively realizing that, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. it, at every moment, anything, it doesn't matter if it's a person, like for sure people, but also um, just things in general have like a definition that helps define them and then mm -hmm. the articulation, the use of that tool or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You'll appreciate this. I was going to, this will be like just a, a fun quip. We, we did, so we're all, we all used to like make fun of the televangelists in my church circles, you know, and now we've all become the televangelists. <laughs> now you're all televangelists. <laughs> well, so am I. I, yeah, always, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be a pastor and like, what do I do? I preach on the internet now. God damn it. <laughs> you, you became the thing you swore to, to yeah. destroy, you know? No, uh, the, uh, it's, so you'll appreciate this though. So in, in order to, to just highlight and keep people connected in whatever ways we can, because isolation there's so many things that go into this COVID thing. I understand the slogan mm. hearing that went like with the stay home, save lives, but that in and of itself was, that was another religious thing. It, it, it convinced people that the only thing that mattered was this physical life thing. And so then if you feel, you start mm. feeling guilt and shame about feeling isolated or very depressed or practicing bad habits that you were kicking like alcohol or whatever, um, abuse, you know, in those ways. And anyway, Interesting, yeah. it's, but that phraseology like made it feel like, well, I, it basically took away and it was so fascinating that it did it. This is what ideologies do. They like bind and blind us, right? It bound mm. us together on the same mission and it blinded us to like critical thinking about it. And that mental health was like in an unhealthy way, like a definition for everything before COVID happened. Like it was like everywhere in popular culture, this idea mm. of mental health mm -hmm. um, and that we need to be considering that and thinking about that. But with COVID, like, it's almost gone. You know, like we're not thinking like, well, this radical isolation that people are going through, that's, it may be the necessary thing we have to do mm -hmm. like, to go into this radical isolation, but we need to be warning people and helping them in whatever way possible oh, yeah. because radical yeah. isolation is not good for yeah. social animals. That's for sure. Anyway, you'll appreciate this though. We did this thing uh, to try and help people stay connected. So we reached out on mother's day to uh, dads in our church and said, Hey, Will you film video of your kids saying like happy mother's day and and kind of a kid say the darndest things vibe you know and yeah. then we asked dads or moms to do the same thing for dads on father's day and there was this thread underlying both of them it was like i love my mom and how she maybe snuggles with me but the primary thing was how she cooks for me and cares for me and hugs me huh. it was like mother hen vibe yeah and then all of the the kids it didn't matter the gender of the kids are like i love the way my dad plays with me he does tickle hmm. monster with me he does what he makes me like jump on his back. Like it was all this like play oriented hmm. um, stuff yeah. that you're talking about, like your preschool stuff. Right? Yeah. And uh, it was fascinating how that cashed out. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so that is interesting. I, I do want to, I want to, maybe this will be kind of where we end up landing the plane. I want to talk about the, I think there's some bullet points we can kind of go through with some of this movement and culture that happened at Evergreen State, but also that ha is happening in culture right now. And I want to kind of go through some of the, we might say, religious tenets within that movement and sort of correlate them. You have this pastor's kid background, so, and you, you're familiar yeah. with some Christians, so you get not just religious language, but Christian religious language. But then I can add my quips as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to go through that, so maybe we can hash out some of those things. Um, but before we do that, can we can can you name um, in fast fashion or whatever? Are there? Do you think um, the ever? It's like a pop thing? quiz. Yeah, 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 for sure. No, 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 it's not that. No, <laughs> no. Do you think? <laughs> I'm wondering. Do you think the Evergreen State moment is uh, is like a narrative or metaphor for what we're seeing in so much of culture? It seemed like you were saying that at hmm. the beginning, but are there ways where it's different, um, or is it mostly the same thing? Just and hmm. mass or translating all over. You know, I, I, I went to Evergreen State College because I wanted to finish my destiny as a writer, and that's kind of what I did. Like, I went there, and I wrote five novels while I was there, and I wrote my magnum opus or my masterpiece, you know, the piece that proves to me that I achieved a, a certain level of mastery. And, and the way that I wanted to tell a story is to take a whole bunch of stories and to figure out how to get all these different stories to, to work together, you know, like to, to turn literature and all of genre into an orchestra and then have them perform a piece of music with all these different layers to it. Um, and kind of like I had this weird kind of like realization or like this change in me uh, right before 
um, you know, right when I was ending that project, I was ending that book and like I was, I was in the shower and like my ego died, like my whole writer ego, like yeah. it was filled with pride and, and ego and all these pretended conversations about how important I was and you know, all these awards and all these interviews, you know, like, like those, those ways in which the ego facilitates or justifies you spending so much time on something that you're not going to get a reward for. So you imagine greatness at the end of this, right? And that's just, it's kind of like a carrot, it's imaginary carrot, right? And, and it is pretentious, but insofar as you put that pretension into work, you get a dividend from it. And I felt like that whole personality that I constructed, this kind of union actually it happened like I was 39. I was like right in the middle of life, you know, like my Dante moment, you know, like yeah. where Virgil comes out of the woods, you know, it's like, I'm done. Like, it doesn't matter. Like all that work that I did, nobody's going to care. Nobody ever cared. And they're not going to care until I'm dead. Like I'm free. <laughs> like it was like, it was this terrible, like destruction that was so liberating. And, um, and then like two or three months later, then everything blossomed that I had been watching. Right. And I remember one of my favorite professors at the Evergreen State College, Leonard Schwartz, who's a uh, poetry professor there. We had a lot of good uh, discussions about um, things. He he had us he gave us an assignment uh, based on uh, something that happened to the writer of the vagina monologues. And I cannot remember her name, but there's this woman who wrote this uh, play called the vagina monologues. And I've never seen it, but um, things are complex now because you're not supposed to have a vagina or vaginas are a verboten thing in this weird gender moral panic. That's like a complete reversion and and satanic version of 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 ultra conservatism. But um, I think that the play is about a bunch of different vaginas is talking and then what it's it's like a woman thing so all the women get up and have all these stories about you know like all the processes of this magical mystery mysterious uh implement of of fecundity and uh progen progeny um but the 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 story behind her writing that was that she was doing a lot of writing about something else. And she just had this idea about like this vagina talking about its own experience. And so in the margins of what she was working on, she was just like pinning this thing and pinning this thing and pinning this thing. And my professor gave us the assignments, like go through your archives, go through your, your work and look for what's going off to the side. Cause that might be the thing that might be the thing. And, um, and I, I totally, I totally screwed up the assignment. I just like made it up and I was like, okay, well, whatever. Like I, I did something stupid. I can't remember what, I, it doesn't matter. It was just stupid. You just got the assignment done though. You didn't like enter into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was very focused on my own thing and I, I just kind of like, I did it. But then like when the whole evergreen thing happened and I'd been like, I'd been watching P the Jordan Peterson, he's a Canadian uh, professor. Yeah, we did, uh, kind of we hosted, a we hosted his document or the documentary that came oh. out on his rise. I hosted it, sorry, here in Portland. Oh, okay. Maybe you invited me to that. Somebody invited me to a showing of that in Portland. We did. You didn't come. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You no, I didn't. No. Yeah, I'm a, I am a total jerk. We had, um, well, it's in a previous interview. There was a lot of different but similar noise with hmm. well the portland style of groups of what you're talking about with antifa and those types that were oh yeah definitely trying to get it shut down so, oh yeah and yeah. threatening it to get it shut down anyway cancel culture is fun yes exactly and so that's <laughs> yeah so you had i think you experienced some level of cancel culture at evergreen you're seeing it happen right uh yeah i the well, cancel it, culture I mean, brett brett was somewhat canceled he's sort of the yeah. icon in this but yeah maybe it's not cancel culture in and of itself it was more well, there, of a there was a moment, lot of, I guess. there the the dynamic the group dynamics of the way that this stuff shut down debate and that's why i started speaking out is because one of the one of the admin teachers that i admire who unfortunately think i betrayed the college which i guess i did in a way because uh the college betrayed its mission of actually teaching people skills and decided to become an indoctrination factory um so i'm justified but i did uh, sacrifice a lot of relationships this individual who i respect i respect still now he came up to me he's like we can't talk nobody can talk like i've never been it's never been like this before like there's a complete chill effect you can't talk to anybody because you don't know if you're going to run afoul i'm like that's 
fucked up. That's messed yeah. up. That's really messed up. So yeah. I'm just going to talk because nobody gives a crap about me. Nobody gives a crap about Benjamin. I like the hairy guy with, uh, you know, like he's like 40 years old, like writing his really weird tomes. Every year he's got like this weird tome and he gives to his teacher and says, you don't have to read it. Just give me the credit. I did all the work. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. You know, like, so I'm just going to talk about this stuff. And like, like just to finish up that story, it's like I had been studying and watching this movement occur and writing letters and watching what happened to Peterson before he got skyrocketed, you know, like there's an early version of Peterson, like going from a professor into somebody who's standing up for an ideal, watching that happen, watching what happened at Yale, watching happen at these protests that the students were doing. And that turned into the marginalia that kind of like morphed into, you know, I, I remember there's this really cheesy moment where I'm on the beach with my uh, special lady friend and, uh, and like, it's right. It's, it, I just did my first video and I, we're sitting on the dock and our cats are walking around us. And I'm like, this is my dragon. Like, this is my dragon. Like yeah. I knew, I know this is what I have to slay. Like, this is my time to do the, enter into that, um, that mode of interacting with the world, which is something that I didn't want to do for a long time, yeah. um, for a number of different reasons. Yeah, no, that's good. So the um, let's let's dive in then on some of the correlations. Was that a pop quiz? What was the pop quiz about that? The I had to name something was, in quick no, fashion. No, no, no. It, it, it was more. Could you name in quick fashion the uh, which you didn't do it quick? So that was you, you failed. But the yeah, uh, I did. <laughs> I'm a failure, but I own it. Well, yeah, that's good. We're <laughs> we're the same then in that respect. So uh, you uh, the idea was more. Were there are there like clear correlations between what you saw at Evergreen and the, oh. cult the cultural moment that we're seeing right now? It, cancel culture is sort of a popular iteration of that, but I think cancel culture oh. is it's a it's a symptom of an underlying reality, right? And the, the underlying reality seems to be ever like what well, these things that were happening yeah. at Evergreen. So yeah, I I, I want to make one point to your listeners. Yeah, one point I think, and this is a prediction. But I think it's pretty much true. The Evergreen State College protest is absolutely wild, phenomenal. You should watch the videos. You will be, you will have some very, it's, it's a good test. It's a good test of your humanity and self-control to watch the, the crazy behavior that's going on. So it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's good. It's roughage for your heart. Um, <laughs> But, but what happened was like, there was this really intense uh, sequence of events. It was very powerful and urgent and violent and crazy, right? But after the dust settled, the major change that happened, and this is what's going to happen with us, there's all these riots and protests and like blah, 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 and hopefully that stuff will peter out. Hopefully it'll peter out um, without too much of a swing in the other direction. Right. But the major fallout of this event is that there will be a billion upon billion dollar industry of people controlling what you can say and think and putting you through all these different pseudo religious mind control bullshit seminars to, to, to train you and to control you. That's what happened at Evergreen. The, the major fallout of Evergreen, the protesters got a freaking room. They got like a bigger equity center. Like they got more segregated space for black people. Like, like that was what the protesters got. Everybody else got more speech control, more office of, you know, equal opportunity, more uh, trigger hair. Like, oh, if you say the wrong thing, you're going to go through a grueling, you know, three week investigation where somebody's going to point out, well, you didn't actually technically do anything wrong, but maybe you should watch your tone of voice. Maybe you shouldn't stand that way because you're threatening people because you are, after all, six feet tall. Maybe you should slouch more, you know, um, like that's the going to be the fallout of this stuff is that actually this this entire battery of dogma is absolutely excellent for corporations because it gives them much more uh it, it gives them much more control over what their workers can say online at work off out of work it, that's ultimately is this is perfectly bent to a tool of authoritarian government and that that is ultimately um, again, not to get political, but that's my ultimate worry about the Democratic Party coming into power is that they will go through and they will implement this stuff full bore. And we will get we will lose Betsy DeVos for good or bad. And we will gain Robin D'Angelo 
for good or bad. That's what's going to happen is that the and it's already happening on the West Coast. The schools are already corrupt and teaching your children to divide themselves by race and teaching them to be ashamed of themselves for this or proud of themselves for this other thing based on these identities. It's it's absolutely toxic stuff. And that's that's my main concern. And that will ultimately be the main fallout of the unrest that we're having right now is more neoliberal um, bureaucratic control of your life. Yeah, and I think you're right. Is the the power of this stuff, and it, it is, well, it's it's religious in a lot of ways, and so yeah. I, I do want to. I think we can kind of. Um, it doesn't have to be rapid fire and like super fast. We can go through some of these religious themes that let's do Christianity in particular, but kind of I'll state a religious theme, and it would be great if you could tell me like what you hmm. think. The, okay, well, this is interesting. The intersectional right. like version of that would be, or whatever you. It's not just intersectional, but you know. Because yeah. so I want to say this, there's a couple of things going on before we dive in. The, I do think these ideas, I think this is a lot of what the Bible is getting at when it talks about possession and when it talks about especially a principality, as, which is more or less a, a personality of a ruler, an empire, a city, right? They can really like possess a person. Like it, yeah. they start yeah. acting yeah. out and yeah. again, they give up themselves to the ideology. Yeah. And, and you know when you're talking to someone in this mode because either they watch something like the because there's not a lot of personal opinion in the things you put out online and if someone can't watch that and be like okay or sorry a lot of the things you put out online has your personal opinion but the evergreen yeah. state part um but anyway if someone goes through that and they don't come away saying well that's wrong you know <laughs> that's not good mm. there's something going on that I don't, that sounds not that you couldn't be wrong on things but well this is the interesting part is that um, my detractors at the Evergreen State College call me racist or privileged or frail or fragile, like the stupid names. Like I, I haven't gotten anybody actually to refute my argument. There, there's a lot of whataboutism. There's one article that three professors wrote and posted to the Huffington Post, the other side of the Evergreen State College story, that completely avoids what happened. It's this, well, what about that? What about that? Well, you have to remember Trump was in office. Trump is in D.C., yeah. which is which is very far away from the most progressive state in the most progressive city in the most progressive college like the, all this stuff like that but nobody's gone through and created this documentary that refutes my claims that this stuff is absolutely toxic that it destroys interpersonal human relationships i don't think it's possible but nobody will even take the challenge so if if they really want to put their back in the work and actually produce an honest documentary that that shows another form of how this stuff is good, then then I, I would welcome that. But I have received nothing but ad hominem or my white privilege is getting in the way or something like that. Yeah. And that's part of what I mean about possession. It's like it's uh, the inability, not just to be critical, but also um, mm. the, the predictability of the people that are like in this. Mm. Like if someone says X, right? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. If I can predict everything else they believe and think about everything, basically, with yeah. almost like complete certainty, I'm not talking to a person anymore. It's an ideology. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it's like the like, gender, gender and the gender pronouns in your bio kind of thing. Like, yes. if, yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting a, it. Yeah. Right. Which I, Peter Bogosian's made a big thing about that, but I think he, he yeah. may have been the one who brought that up. But that's a great way of putting it. So there's that piece that's like very religious. But before we get into these definitions, there's this idea. Well, actually, I don't know if you guys got into this version of it. You talked about Apocalypse with Paggio and Vanderclay. I didn't get to see it yet, right? Oh, you should with watch Paul it. Vanderclay. It's really, I, I, I kind of, uh, Paul Vanderclay and Jonathan Peugeot. You, who is Paul Vanderclay? No, no, no. I was saying it was the both of them all with you, yeah. right? Is that right? Yeah. 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 yeah, I just published that like last night. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, people should go watch it. I'll watch it. That would be good. Um, but yeah. there's this idea of Apocalypse. Um, I'm doing some study on it right now, and it's mm -hmm. this idea of, the Greek word, I mean, it's a, it is a Greek word, and it just means revelation or revealing. So it's an mm. unveiling um, mm. picture. And yeah. uh, that's the reason why the book of Revelation is called Revelation. Uh, it's this unveiling. And what it is, it's an unveiling of is these underlying, like, spiritual or um, religious realities, right? So it, yeah. it unveils what is normally covered up by earth or people or our humanity, yeah. if you will. So anyway, yeah. there's something in there. I want to try and like apocalypse some of this stuff with you, I guess. So oh, okay. let's try and figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and it sounds like you're like well averse in it now from your talk the other day. 
so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's let's do like let's do the popular things. Like, what would be like sin, and as far as you can tell, in this um, this structure? There is a certain aspect of sin that, and this. I, I believe that John McWhorter, who's a fabulous public intellectual, or he's probably more than a public intellectual. I think he's actually a professor. I know he's actually a professor, but he's also a public intellectual. He he does this whole thing where anti-racism is the new religion. And, and he does a lot of that mapping where this is that, this is that, this is that, this is that. And I, I, I find that that way of going about things isn't as, as visceral, but there is a definite sin where you confess your privilege and you start to see your privilege everywhere and everybody has privilege right everybody has privilege i mean you can't be uh there's certain aspects of this doctrine that get out um and, and start to say well only white people can be racist because racism is a systemic thing black people don't have the power to actually be racist they they can just have some you know racist attitudes but it's not it doesn't actually count right so but what you're supposed to do and this is the problem in the ultimate downfall of intersectionality because what intersectionality does is that it it slices it like takes the the individual and it puts them through this cheese grater of like of oppressions and then like all these crumbs of of identity fall it's like okay well i'm not i'm not that articulate so i don't have articulate pri privilege or i don't have smart privilege or i have smart privilege or i have humor privilege this is the one thing this is the one thing that they'll never touch beauty privilege and wit privilege right it's like you can't be mad at somebody for being funny than you because it's very obvious that you're just envious that you don't get them so you're an idiot or you can't be funny like them so you just want their attention or you can't really be mad at somebody for being beautiful because that's the same thing as just the skin you're born in but actually actually scientifically speaking and this is one of the scientists at the evergreen state college is a stand-up guy told me this the the only actually um scientifically proven form of privilege is actually beauty like yeah. people treat you very good if you are attractive to them, right? And, and that's just completely unfair. And funny or just witty or whatever, yeah. you can. I've seen that. Um, I've seen that. Yeah, and I've even like caught myself doing that, where I'm like, if someone else did that, I would be I would be nearly as forgiving or like give the benefit mm -hmm. of the doubt, you know, like whatever, yeah. like a work behavior, let's say, or something, you know. Yeah. It's like, but you just you re if you're again trying to be self aware, you can recognize that for sure. But yeah, yeah I think. Like you said, scientifically, it's proven for hiring practices, for promotional practices. Yeah. Beauty is a great equalizer across cultures, even. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so that that concept of sin or privilege, it breaks down on certain levels of analysis. They try to keep it close to the material, and in order to, I guess, I I think that ultimately this this sin will turn into the concept of what they're what are they called. To get your relative out of purgatory, um, that you paid the c Catholic Church. Oh, like uh, indulgence or a indulgences. Uh, yeah, yeah. indulgences. So eventually, uh, it will lead to reparations. That will yeah. be a form of indulgences. So that's what ultimately what they want. They want positions of power, representative positions of power, which is what, basically what these diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, bureaucrats are. It's it's a reparations program to get people of color to staff up the the institutions and and even out the diversity on the on the number books. But they want more. They want power. They want resources. So they, they'll they'll keep that sin towards the more um visible like like whiteness right but they won't but you can start to break it down by just saying that there's so much more to a human being but it reduces you into this into these categories and then in every interaction you have to uh check your privilege or uplift your oppression right so it, it ruins every human interaction because you're always like you're 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 breaking yourself down and raising somebody up instead of actually getting along and building something yeah no there's and that is there's something in that about the, uh, I was saying before that it seems like almost like untrammeled deconstructionism without any desire. Cause there is something about, we talked about earlier, like part of human development is deconstructing or questioning things from your past and yeah. resurrecting or um, uh, creating something that's the new you or the yeah. you that will be for the next 10 years, at least until you get your 39 year old crisis or whatever you said. You yeah, had, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, there's something there. Um, but I don't think it's just pure deconstructionism. Like it, it is, it has an element of that, like with the constant purification that's going on, but mm. it does want to build something. I just, I don't know what that something is, but it seems to want to build something. Does it though? 
I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, no. that's a, maybe I, just, I, I think it, it just it just wants power for itself. It just wants representation. It doesn't want to create anything good. It just wants to take what's good and redistribute it. It's yeah. it's a zero sum game. It's a zero sum game. You yeah. can't be creative in a zero sum world. Everything is theft. Yeah. Everything is theft. And it makes, like you said, every human interaction is now. It's not just like you should be skeptical, but it's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's goofy. So, which so would be another form? Like, there is isn't there a technical term for uh, you know asceticism or ascetic pra practices? Prehutton is the Ind uh, Indonesian term, but like uh, any sort of uh, yeah, we do like self-flagellating and that like, or thing. fasting or any sort of oh uh, sure yeah. There's there's a uh, intentional limiting factors. There's yeah physical. I mean, food fasting is the primary biblical ideal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in a but weird fasting way. from lust, fasting from pleasures, you know, so there, there, it's a readapted that into, you know, like this, this kind of the, the, the negative aspect of or where, where that religious practice goes too far is when you start to become proud because of how much pain you can withstand. Right. Yes. Like, like that's basically that's, that's Jesus's critique, man. It's like it's a it's the you don't you don't fast in the public square and say, oh, like wipe dust on your face and it's like why are you so dirty oh, i've just been fasting for four weeks you know it's yeah. like no you don't do that you know That's yeah. Self -righteous. Yeah. Anyway. yeah yeah which is virtue signaling which is uh actually another narcissistic sociopathic quality that is unlocked or enabled by this uh this movement yeah so self-righteousness would be like virtue signaling do you want to explain a little bit of what that is self-righteousness no 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 virtue signaling yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think i know what it is but i don't know if everyone listening will Virtue signaling. Well, this is this is the problem, and I try. I I mock it, and you can feel it when it happens. It's like it's like that old definition of pornography. It's like, well, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. Right? You have to actually um, project bad faith into somebody um, somebody's statement. All right. So it's basically a statement that's performative, that's performed in social media nowadays, where you claim to be good by either putting somebody else down or making yourself somehow the center of attention on an issue. Right. Mm. It, it, it's a it's an ego. Uh, instead of becoming a mirror, you become like an object of, of worship. Right. Yeah. And instead of like showing the issue, you put the. Uh, attention on yourself and you do it by means of uh, mobilizing a moral make tricks and stuff and the the problem with this ideology and i think it is directly related to protestantism it's it's a direct outgrowth of our world and it's deeply deeply christian it's absolutely deeply christian but it's a christianity that's forgotten itself that's what it is essentially and it has it has tons of, of rhymes, you know, with previous incarnations of Puritanism in the United States, moral panics yes. and stuff like that. So um, it just it's it's garbed in newfangled academic language with a pinch of Marxism and a whole lot of social media, uh, you know, like personality disorders and identity yeah. uh, issues uh, bundled up in it. Yeah, Nietzsche talked about it wasn't just around the death of God. I talked about it a couple of times, but he talks about the idea that like, you know, his one of his concerns about this whole a lot of what he was throwing out there for the solution was conceptual and then for the superman mm -hmm. or whatever and it's not like he thought like this is what's happening he's like this will happen and i don't think it cashed out like he hoped in those respects mm -hmm. but anyway a lot of what he threw out there was that his concern that that wouldn't work out is that um people would retain the ability to judge and condemn one another which is something like that sin tends to do right it judges mm -hmm. or condemns you is yeah. missing the mark or whatever you want to say um and it's not just breaking rules though i think that's a bad definition of sin but anyway it's missing the mark and uh his concern was that this new whatever comes out will uh mm -hmm. lose the uh the ability to forgive the yeah. ability to practice forgiveness and uh because that is something a good that religion but especially like the christianity that he was mostly pointed at had you know mm -hmm. but he was worried mm -hmm. it would it would retain the judgment and lose the forgiveness as the point and uh anyway i think i do think that's I, spot on with a lot of this stuff i don't i mean it, looking at the evergreen state college story it doesn't seem like there's redemption there's allyship mm -hmm. there's being on the right side of history but there's no redemption so the main antagonists if you want to cast them that way if you want to say okay there's this one professor called naima Lowe, and she 
probably mobilized, if not directly, then indirectly, certainly, uh, a lot of the protesters and, and empowered a lot of the protesters, you know, so she bears a certain amount of responsibility. She loses it during the protest and she just wails on uh, or screams at her fellow prof professors and tells them to get inside or go home. So either obey the mob or get out of Dodge, right? Um, and and you're like, well, okay, well, what is the redemption? So so this person completely embodied this stuff. And I watched her. I, I, I was in the media department. I would never have studied under her because she couldn't teach me. Any, I, ironically, I never studied a lick of, of movies. And she was a media professor and like look how the tables have turned in a certain respect i think uh, anyways that, that's very proud of me and I, I apologize for that but um if you look at her arc so she uh gets a lot of negative attention she gets you know death threats and people send her pictures of she's a black woman uh, rather overweight uh totally this embodiment of the angry black woman that that black activists are always accusing people of seeing black women as like they, they always preemptively don't you don't judge the one you always think of us as angry we're not angry you know it's like well no you actually are <laughs> you're like you're angry you're like embodying the stereotype that that you perceive everybody perceiving you as so she she gets a lot of negative attention and brett weinstein does call her out because she has a lot of power and she puts brett in a position of of being accused of being racist and not being able to defend himself because there's no place for him to defend himself she is just assigned her, her judgment to him like you're racist and you're racist it's like oprah and you're racist and you're racist and you're racist right <laughs> So, yeah. so she gets a lot of backlash. She puts a whole lot of hate in the world. I have footage of her screaming about every white person at this, at this pride rally is, is filled with white supremacy and you need, I'm not going to let you take the agenda. It's like filled with hate, filled with anger, filled with rage, completely justified by this ideology. Mm -hmm. She gets, um, she gets a lot of, um, online hate. She puts a lot of hate in the world. She gets a lot of hate back. She, and then she starts screaming, I'm under assault. I'm under assault. Look at all these people sending me all these bad pictures and calling me a bad person, you know? And like, I did this one episode and it's not a part of the uh, documentary, but I went through and I just showed that, yeah, there are some pretty very tasteless and stuff that I would never send myself. Like there's some statements and pictures and bad words, but actually that was a small fraction of what she got. She actually got a whole lot of criticism about how she is not fit to be a, a teacher. Like if you look at her being criticized by the public and you focus only on that one little lynching picture you get and you completely ignore all the criticism of you get, that's what the Evergreen State College did up to this day. They focus when they talk about the protest, they focus on that alt-right shooter that was like some 50 year old 3000 miles away who wasn't all right. He didn't even own any guns. Right. But like we had a death threat, you know, to completely ignore everything, completely ignore Benjamin Boyce, actually pay money to an ad firm to get me suppressed, to get all the criticism suppressed and focus on that one thing. So that's what Naima Lowe did. She, she files a suit with the college that she, like somebody made fun of her name. Okay. And so she's been, she's in a bad work environment. The college cuts their losses, gives her $250,000 and she goes away. A uh, year and a half later, she, uh, this essay surfaces on Medium where she goes through and she tells her side of the story. She's a victim the whole time. And like, she's an angry black person and, and, and people only see her anger and, and God damn it, but that's who I am. And, and, and at the end of her essay, she, she ends her essay and my mommy and daddy love me. Right. And my dad says, you know, you're just angry and they can't take you, Naima. Like, okay, th there's no, re there's no redemption. And, and, th and then what is she doing now? She's now making fuck the police uh, paraphernalia. And I'm sorry to say that word, put that in quotes, but literally t-shirts and coffee mugs. There is no, for the person who completely embodied that is never free. So she wants to enslave everybody else. To this thing so i don't i don't see redemption actually working there's reparations but they're not they're not quantifiable you can't just pay seven dollars for every uh privilege that you have right you just have to constantly be eternally paying this indulgence so it, yeah. there's no there's no release i have not seen that yet i think indulgence like you said is the right word it's not because it's not i mean it's not a form of salvation or redemption right i mean the only form of the faux salvation that seems to be there is these ideas around like 
hmm. checking your privilege is a shorthand for it, but these these short these these ways in which you acknowledge and um, share about your privileges. That's some part of the salvation narrative. It seems like that's what you well, need to do. It's well, confession. The confession. So there's confession. Yeah, maybe that. yeah, maybe that's that. Yeah. But there's no, uh, there's no absolution. There's no absolution. There's no Christ. There's yeah. no Jesus. Like, there's yeah. no like, yeah. there's no release from it. There's just well, internal there's, hatred. There's even, and I've seen it shared um, again and sometimes by people and I'm like, I know you, this isn't like, mm. by people sharing this on social media. I'm like, I know this isn't the way that you think, but saying things like, um, mm. I might mix up the phrase, but it's like, the only thing I know is that I can never know. And the only thing I know is that there's will always be a problem and I can never actually, the problem will never be solved, but I'm listening or something. It's like, that's, if there's no do objective the goal, like, well, yeah, do right. The that's, so that's do the work. A platitude work. comes in and it's like, that is a road to the unhealthiest version of nihilism. Like there's no reason to live in that. If there's hmm. no, no fixing, no constructing, oh, no building, God. no creating. Like yeah. You said, yeah. Then, there's uh, no release. That's right. There's no release. And there's something in, I mean, the idea of, um, I brought him up way too much in this talk, dude, but Hype talks about with uh, Lukianoff, they put it, mm -hmm. when they wrote their book, um, uh, The Colony of the American, American Mind. Yeah. They put it together really succinctly, which was helpful because Hype isn't always succinct, but yeah, <laughs> they put it together really well where they said, uh, the ideal that we seem to be on a good path for was this idea of the common humanity. Um, yeah. A genesis of a lot of that was like riding out of the on the wave of the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. Yeah, and that was like we had we were on a really good path for that. And this ideology comes in and not only fractionates us into these identities, but it fractionates us into common enemies, right? So it's it's a coalition building in some respects, yeah. but it's not coalition building for all people, it's good guys yeah. and bad guys in a cosmic battle. Yeah, yeah, but the seeds of its destruction are in there. So the question is, is that how much is it going to lay waste before it runs its course, but it, it's not stable. Right. So, so I everybody's an enemy of everybody else eventually. Right. Like, like if the native American tribe that's being uh, enlisted in the intersectional rubric has problems with certain strands of transgender ideology, who's more oppressed and who wins. Right. If, if there's a contradiction between these different balkanized groups, how does the con contradiction get resolved if it's only ever oppression that's binding everybody together? It's like the white man can only take so much of your hatred before it starts going in all these other ways. Yeah. Like, like the, the scapegoat not, is not sufficient to what you're summoning. It's not. No, and summoning. Yeah, right. And the uh, you're like you're bringing out the worst in me, Benjamin, I shouldn't say these things online, but uh -oh. the, uh, oh, no. <laughs> these are like I'm private sorry. thoughts of mine that I'm like musing on and haven't said out loud yet, but there's something, what I don't understand, dude, is in some of the logic with some of this is I understand, like you said, privilege is a real thing to a degree, but then how we moralize it or how we address mm. it, that's a completely different thing. So like but privilege, it is a real thing. We need to like figure out um, assessing it in some ways. I mean, it's, well, it's a real thing and in what ways, right? I don't know. Um, I just don't know what to do with that conversation. It's like, okay, what do I do? Okay, so you have privilege, I have privilege. It's like, it just reminds me of growing up. I'm the oldest of five and we would fight over the stupidest things. Yes. It was always just a form of privilege. Like who gets to sit at the special chair at the table? Who gets the special spoon? Who gets, oh, you got the special bowl. You know, it's like, that, where does that go? <laughs> like, who cares? Yeah, and it's not like, a, well, and it's but that's the thing. Like, what do we what do we do with it? That's the right thing. Like, yeah. do we turn it into this moral matrix by which we judge and fix the world? I don't think so. <laughs> um, but then, so but something I've been musing on, and like I said, you're like bringing this out. Um, but mm. it's the uh, there's the short sightedness of some of this. Well, on the one hand, watching it from a distance, I thought this thing's just going to cannibalize itself. I'll just even before Evergreen State, like I just saw some of this ideology happening, um, even within the LGBTQ IA plus community, I was like, eventually it's going to cannibalize with the way it's cycling in the ideology and narrative that seems to be popping up, especially once you got to T, you know? Um, mm. And so anyway, I, I thought it's sad and like there's people involved, but the worst versions of this will die out. And they just, well, they mostly didn't. But anyway, <laughs> the short sightedness of it, of a lot of this stuff uh, had me thinking like, okay, so here's a scenario. 
say we we get everything we start paying reparations and we even do like a mule and an acre to every person that like has whether we can prove it or not that just like checks off certain boxes that was oppressed through slavery in the past so then they would be technically speaking the benefactors of white supremacy colonial practices because they were they're now sitting on land that was originally native land um, and they're on property that was originally earned and bought by colonial practices, you know. Um, and, and so then wouldn't, therefore, like if we paid reparations to black folks, wouldn't they, therefore, become the bad guy to the natives? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. They're now the benefactors of white privilege in some strange way. You know what I mean? Yeah, see, it's selective. It always pulls back from the point where it becomes contradictory or where it starts to cede power. There's no humility. There's no value of humility, right? Yeah. There's 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 a lot of humiliation for sure, but it's always pointed in a certain direction. There's no humility in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, um, what, 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 maybe we'll like land the plane here a little bit. What, what what's your suggestion? Like, what should we do about this? Other than subscribe to you, which would be good. Um, what else should we do about mm. what we're seeing at the level of the individual? Because one yeah. thing before you answer that, dude. There's there's what I don't understand, I can't tell how prevalent and how um, how widespread this thing is. I know it's a there's a very loud version of it online. Yeah. But in a lot of my interpersonal relationships, um, even with people that I've seen like post a thing here or there, like again trying their best to understand a concept like privilege, but not understanding everything that's baked into the cake. Yeah. Um, with those people, I don't see the worst iterations that we're talking about, but I also see uh, media, uh, not just like in the commentary and punditry of politics, but media and, and film and in TV really playing with this stuff. And, and maybe, maybe that's because of the corporatism, like you talked about, but mm -hmm. anyway, how, how big of a problem is this is part of what I'm getting at too. Like, and what, yeah. do, what does the individual need to do about it? Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So I, I went into panic mode when the riots started happening and, and I tried to do it, I tried to critique it in such a way that I'm not, I'm not diminishing the issue at hand, but I'm showing the tactics for what they are, you know, and I spent a month and I did a video a day, just deconstructing all these different phenomena that were going on. And then, <laughs> and then my birthday came and I'm like, okay, do nothing. And I just didn't feel good all day. I just like, I felt, there was something going, I was like really tense and like, I was just, I was just really being conscious of myself, you know, and, and just like giving myself a day to just pay attention to who I am and, and just to check in. Right. Um, and then coming out of that, I'm like, you know, I can't, I can't interact with this stuff every day. I can't, it's, it's really good for my numbers, right. On YouTube sure. and stuff. It really spreads me around and I'm really relevant and I'm doing a lot of good work or I'm, I'm satisfying a need in the marketplace, but, um, I need to figure out another way of doing that. I have to switch things up. So if you look at it, it's everywhere. If you don't look at it, where is it really, you know, is it in your business? Is it in your church? Is it here? Is it there? Is it taking over government? It's in the school systems. I know that. Um, right. if, if you can't, this is the problem. This is the problem with it and the problem with dealing with it. If you start to see it and really deal with a monster, how do you not become a monster yourself? How do you not become a, let's say an appendage of a monster, you know, by interacting with it? So when I was going through and, and critiquing this stuff, I'm like, okay, people are going to get swept up in this, but eventually they're going to want a way out. So how do we provide people with ways out? How do we provide people to be honest with themselves and not be so ashamed mm -hmm. to, to, to like slowly deal with the shame that's going to come over them when they realize that what they've done um, in the name of justice is the opposite right? or done in the name of equality. So how do you, how do you give a landing pad for ex cult members? You know, like how do you give people who aren't decided a place to interact with the issues? What is the, what the evergreen state college story taught me was that the thing that was destroyed that led to the madness was human to human interaction. Like the, the mm. dialogue was gone. The place where a human being can interact with another human being was gone. So what, what I suggest is that, yeah, you, 
if you see something that you're uncomfortable with, yes, speak up. It's important to speak up, call out things, ask questions. Like if you see it encroaching, if you're worried about it, question it, challenge it for sure. But above all else, connect with human beings as human beings and center the human experience center center not just the oppression and the identity but the humanity in in every group and every person and and proceed with that project whether it's liberal or christian or wherever that project uh those core values really derive for you and really land for you like like center that center i guess love is a good concept if we can get back to a good version of it you know mm -hmm. um or anything like that like return to the core values and return to a way of interacting with human beings that expands and, and opens up new vistas of, of, of shared human experience rather than contracts them into forms of belief. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of, it's kind of my tact right now. Yeah. You, you, you that was a great sermon, Benjamin. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, honestly. Yeah. The, the idea of getting people in. So I'm so glad you were, uh, able and willing to do this talk because that's part of it just getting people in the room that we I don't know how many disagreements we would have but there mm. would probably be plenty when we start talking about um, different areas of eschatology living. sure eschatology yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, but but we're not demanding this creation of this utopia you know like we're like okay mm. utopia is something like a uh, common humanity like that's more of the ideal you know that's the the I yeah if you think of utopia as an ideal like the ideal for us is how can we create a common humanity? I think a great way to do that is to get in the room together. We're in the virtual room right now together, but yeah. Um, yeah. even though we have some disagreements, but if we can do that with other people, that would be huge. huge. Yeah. Um, Music, and, food, laughter, yeah. just the core human values, you know? Exactly. Yeah. No, that's great. I, I want to close with the thought. There was, um, I think it wraps up a lot of what we're talking about. There was this moment um, in MLK's life where he mm. writes to, um, Malcolm X's wife, actually, a letter after he had been assassinated. And in that letter, I'm sure he knew the letter was going to be public. So he said in that letter a couple of times, um, now, you, you know that my husband and, and or your husband and I, we, we disagreed on plenty, you know. Hmm. Um, but the way he said it was so clever. Every single time he said, I believe that your husband and I had our finger on the exact same problem. We just disagreed on methodology at mm. the end of the day. And mm. there was something in that that if they could have believed that out loud together, like there could have been such a uniting factor mm. and force there, even mm. though their methodology was drastically different. I mean, the idea of loving your enemy is deeply humanizing, you know, um, and, and mm. sacrificial mm. and so many things that call out the best in humanity that King yeah. was up to. But if we yeah. can get to something like that, where we, yeah. Um, I think there might be something there. If we can find ways to humanize these people that are getting swept up into this, um, yeah. not necessarily the, progenitors of it that's very hard when it's like the priest you know but when it's the people that are swept up into it and caught up into it if mm -hmm. we can find ways to like connect the common humanity and say no you're recognizing a problem like there there are racist things that happen or like certain disparities yeah. that happen yeah. your methodology is just terrible you know yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so how can we like talk about that you know anyway yeah so yeah that's a good that's a good tact dude thanks for hanging out today i appreciate Thank you, you so much adam thanks for doing the work you're doing, doing thanks for making work. me think yeah, yeah. I am yeah. doing the work. Yes, yes. Good deal. <laughs> well, I do encourage people to follow you, man. All right. And I hope you take Hello care. Here. You should right, be on dude. Twitter and YouTube, right? Yeah. Benjamin A. Boyce on both platforms. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Have a good day. All right, man. You have a good day. Later. Ciao.